Hi everybody, this is a review of the subtopic 11.1 .1, antibody production and vaccination. So the essential idea here is that immunity is based on recognition of self and destruction of foreign material. So that's sort of related to what we were talking about with the self and non-self cells and how your body can recognize each cell or thing that enters the body as either being of itself, of its own body, or of a foreign substance or a foreign cell, which would recognize it as a pathogen. So since we're focused on antibody production here, and of course vaccination, uh, this is going to be part of the specific immune response, so not the non-specific response. Um, here we've got a really cool micrograph of a macrophage engulfing the tuberculosis bacteria, which is shown in the yellow. The macrophage is the red cell. And so after the bacteria gets engulfed by the macrophage, remember that it's going to actually present the, the antigen on the, from the outside of the bacteria to other cells, other lymphocytes, and then the antibody production process would begin. Always make sure that you have a look at all of the understandings that you'll need to know for this subtopic, as well as some of the guidance statements that might be there, and the applications and skills that you would be expected to show or practice. Okay, this slide is just about how every organism has unique molecules on the surface of its cells, and what are those um, molecules called? They're called antigens, right? And so those are involved with cell communication and your own body cells recognizing other cells as either being self cells or non-self cells. And so here we have some images of antigens on the outside of a bacterium, for example, and a virus. And they're noted by those different shapes right there. Here we have a review slide about the ABO blood groups. And the reason why this is brought up in this topic is that each of your blood cells actually has antigens on the outside of them, unless, of course, your blood type O, which it doesn't have any antigens on the outside. If you're blood type A, you have the A antigen marker on the outside. If you're blood type B, you have the B antigen marker. If you're blood type AB, you have both A and B antigen markers on the outside. Okay, and so this is the reason why you, if you're blood type A, for example, you cannot receive blood type B or blood type AB from other people. If you needed a blood transfusion, for example, because you were losing a lot of blood for whatever reason, you should never accept blood from blood type B or blood type AB people, only from other blood type A or um, blood type O. And so this is kind of interesting because you don't normally think of blood as being considered a pathogen, and, and really it isn't. Um, it's just that your body will recognize other blood types that do not have your antigen on them and that would have a different antigen as a foreign pathogen. So for example, um, because if you were blood type A, right, and you have the A antigen on the outside, your blood is also producing the anti-B antibody, meaning it produces this antibody partially just to fight off um, other foreign pathogens. So for example, if you received blood type B, then your cells would st would recognize that antigen B on the outside, and because it has the antigen B on the outside, it's going to recognize it actually as a pathogen, as a non-self cell, and so these anti-B antibodies are then going to attach to that antigen and treat uh, the blood type B cells that were injected into your body as a foreign pathogen and those antibodies are going to attach to the antigens and then mark it for destruction or render the cells useless. So essentially you're just attacking the blood that would have been injected into your body. So maybe you've heard before that blood type O is actually a universal donor. Anybody can accept blood type O into their bodies and the reason being is that Blood type O does not have any antigens on its outer surface of its cells. So 
your body is not going to recognize it as a foreign invader or foreign pathogen. If your blood type AB, you're actually a universal recipient, so you're kind of lucky because you can receive any other type of blood because you can accept blood type O because it doesn't have any antigens on the outside, so you're not going to recognize it as a foreign pathogen or invader. You can accept blood type B because you do have the blood type B antigens, and then you can accept blood type A because you would have the blood type A um, antigens as well. And you're not producing any antibodies because what? Well, the only antibodies you would be able to produce would be anti-B antibodies or anti-A antibodies, but why would you do that? Because then you would be attacking your own blood cells. Okay, so this statement, B lymphocytes are activated by T lymphocytes in mammals. Here we're getting into more of the specificity of those lymphocytes. So we know that lymphocytes are involved in antibody production, but now in the higher level 11.1, .1, we're learning about the specific types of lymphocytes that are going to activate the antibody production process. And so how that happens is we have a phagocyte, right? Just like in nonspecific immune response where you have a phagocyte that will engulf uh, a foreign pathogen. Similar idea here. The phagocyte is engulfing the pathogen and digesting it. And then this is where something else happens. And this is with specific immunity only. So the phagocyte is actually going to take the antigen and then um, push it out onto the outer surface of its cell membrane and present it to uh, the uh, helper T cell. And so the helper T cell is going to recognize that antigen with its receptor, as you can see it's doing right here, and it's now activated. It's also worth noting that not just any helper T cell can recognize that antigen that is presented. So it does have to be a very specific helper T cell. There are thousands of different types of helper T cells, and each of them have different receptors on the outside. It's only when a specific helper T cell with a specific receptor recognizes that antigen that's presented to it um, by the phagocyte that ate the pathogen, that it is then activated. It's considered activated at this point. Okay, so the second part of this is the B lymphocytes are activated by the T lymphocytes. Okay, we didn't finish the process yet. We activated the T lymphocyte, but now the B lymphocyte actually has to be activated as well. And so the way that that happens is the helper T cell, and you can think of it as it's helping the B lymphocyte to be activated, right? The helper T cell helps the B lymphocyte to be activated. So it goes over to the B lymphocyte and activates it. So what does that mean? Well, we'll talk about what happens once the B lymphocyte is activated. But for now, you just need to know the helper T cell activates the B lymphocyte. Okay, and what's the main goal of all of this? It's to produce antibodies for a specific immune response. Okay, it's also worth noting that the B lymphocyte over here, before it gets activated by the helper T cell, it is also a very specific lymphocyte. There are, again, thousands of B lymphocytes, just like there are thousands of T lymphocytes and T helper T cells that are going to be searching for, with their receptors, uh, the correct antigen of the pathogen that matches, and you can see he says, this one fits. So now that he found the one that his receptor fits with, right, the antigen on the pathogen that its receptor fits with, then it can be activated by the helper T cell. By the way, the helper T cells over here are the ones that are involved with HIV. So the HIV virus, remember, they do attack those helper T cells, the T lymphocytes that we talked about in um, 6.3, 
that are attacked and the numbers go way down and then causes AIDS is these helper T cells. So HIV attacks the cells that actually activate the other cells that cause antibody production. So essentially, HIV prevents antibody production, which is really bad because you need those antibodies for specific immune response to fight off a bunch of different pathogens. Okay, so maybe you were wondering what happens after the B cells, the B lymphocytes, are activated, right? We were talking before here, what happens actually after that T helper T cell activates the B lymphocyte? Well, what happens is the B lymphocyte then divides and splits off and makes copies of itself into plasma cells and memory cells. So the memory cells are there for a very important reason for immune response, for to create immunity within the body. The plasma cells, what they're going to do, their job is to just produce thousands and thousands of antibodies. So you can see the plasma cell is creating tons of antibodies. Those antibodies then, you know, attach to the antigen on the pathogen and either marks it for destruction or renders it useless. And we'll talk about the different ways that antibodies can um, disable a pathogen or destroy a pathogen. The memory cells, again, are very important for establishing or conferring immunity in your body. So those are called memory cells because they will stick around long after the plasma cells and the antibodies are being produced and long after the pathogen is destroyed so that in case your body encounters the pathogen again, it can then trigger the immune response. It's also worth noting that these memory cells not only trigger the immune response, but they're going to trigger the immune response way faster than as if your body was initially exposed to the pathogen for the first time. Okay, so antibodies aid in the destruction of pathogens. Here we're getting more into the specifics of how antibodies actually aid in the destruction of pathogens. So antibodies do function all in different ways, um, but all of those functions are consequence of their initial attachment to the antigen. So essentially, because it attaches to the antigen, it can do all of these different things to destroy or render the pathogen useless. So we've got neutralization, and so that's when the attachment of the, of the antibody is actually going to stop the toxins um, from affecting or entering the cells, virus stops viruses from invading the cells, and it stops bacteria from efficiently functioning and therefore from stops them from attacking the cells as well. Here we've got opsonization. You don't need to know the specific names of all of these um, things, but I would remember maybe two or three of the ways that antibodies do stop pathogens and destroy them or stop them from functioning. So opsonization though is through attachment of antibodies that mark the pathogens making them easily identifiable by other immune cells. So this is what I mean when I say it marks them for destruction. Essentially the antibody marks the pathogen and then other um, lymphocytes such as macrophages can then come in and they know that they're supposed to destroy and engulf and digest that pathogen. Agglutination, it enhances the effects of neutralization and opsonization because it makes the antibodies actually attach to each other and then clump to each other. So after the antibodies attach to the antigen on the pathogen, then the pathogens start sort of clumping together and attaching to each other. And then that, if you could imagine, uh, just makes them less functional and less able to uh, hurt your body cells. And it also makes them even more noticeable to like macrophages so that they can engulf and digest them. And then we've also got complement activation where antibodies encourage other components to attach to the pathogen attacking it. So 
this can just cause other molecules essentially to also clump on kind of like with agglutinization or agglutination um, which then breaks the bacterial membrane for example or the membrane of whatever pathogen it is and causes the cell to sort of pop and lice and break apart.